Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here. I am the last keynote at PD Week 2019. I'm not sure why, uh, but we made it here. How many people in this room actually made it the entire week? Like you went to every session for the entire five days. A couple people. Congratulations. Your children don't know anymore. And you know, no, I'm joking. Uh, that is great. You know, I was trying to see, you know, I missed the first couple days. So, you know, one of the best ways of seeing some of the insights, some of the thought-provoking knowledge bombs that people were dropping is to go to Twitter and see what people were tweeting about the conference. So this is exactly what I did. But unfortunately, the only thing I saw on Twitter was uh, this guy. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not sure, and just constant pictures. There's another one of him, <laughs> and another one, and, and, and another one. And it's funny, like, I, I wanted to be at that discussion in Halifax when they were like, Larry, we need you to go for a week in a lobster costume. It'll be fine. <laughs> I actually heard the, I heard the backstory. Apparently, Catherine, uh, who is Larry's wife, convinced him to do that. He must have done something really terrible. I don't know what he did. <laughs> no, but I'm really excited to be here, ladies and gentlemen, uh, talking about innovation and disruption. I'm going to try to summarize everything that everybody has said over the last five days into this one presentation. And um, it's really gonna be about innovation and disruption. And this is the space that I'm passionate about. This is all I read, write, work, and speak on. And I have to give you a little bit of background when it comes to my history, when it comes to innovation. Um, I started my career at, at a company called Singapore Press Holdings in Singapore. They had a monopoly over all the newspapers in Singapore. And my job there was to be their media strategist, to be their futurist, to figure out what the future of media would look like. And to be honest with you, I had no idea how to do this job, none whatsoever. And I remember going to my boss at the time, that's Tony Malik, that's him. I remember going to him and asking him, how do you go about being a media strategist, futurist? He said, it's really easy, Sean. He said, all you have to do is take a look at what the best companies are doing around the world and take the best practices from the best companies and implement those ideas here at Singapore Press Holdings. I said, that's a really great idea. Of course, that makes sense. Take the best practices from the best companies and implement them here. The other thing he told us to do was to go on the street and ask people what they wanted from a newspaper. So this is exactly what I did as well. I went on the street and I asked people what they wanted. I'm not, so sh I'm not sure why I was so close to them. Uh, <laughs> But this was a different era, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. But this is what we did too. We went on the street and we asked people what they wanted from a newspaper. And both the best companies in the world and the people in the street actually said the same exact thing, which was how do we go from a broadsheet newspaper to a tabloid-sized newspaper? Like how could somebody take a newspaper and read it on the train? That's what we were talking about. We never talked about social or mobile or cloud or analytics or any of the ways that people get media today. In fact, most people get their social media through social media, Facebook and Twitter today. We never would have thought that at all. And to be honest with you, sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night with a nightmare thinking I was the reason why the newspaper industry sucks today. <laughs> Is it because of my work? And actually, I'll never make the same mistake again which is getting really romantic about what's happening only within my industry, but instead taking a look at what's happening at a, at a macro level. Like what are those big disruptors that are impacting every single organization? And that's what we're gonna do today. Because what's really happening today is that you have all these individual technologies that are seemingly going from somebody's basement to mainstream, from irrelevant to relevant, from nothing to something, from zero to a hundred. And these technologies are converging. And this is why we're seeing the most chaotic era in government and in business and in finance ever. This era is called the exponential era. And I believe that in an exponential era, we need exponential leaders, exponential finance leaders. I think it's going to be very exciting. This era is very different from the industrial era. It's very different. 
In fact, a lot of the narratives that we've been carrying on for the last 30 and 40 years will be completely disrupted because of this new era. And what I want to do today a little bit is talk about some of those narratives that we have told to ourselves and to other people over the last 30, 40 years and show you how it's really getting disrupted. You know, one of the first narratives that I hear all the time today, in fact, 100% of people would say this, that our workforce does not have the skills needed for an exponential world. This is the narrative that I hear all the time. And I would argue that yes, we do. We do have the skills. Let me explain. When I think about this idea of preparing people for the future, naturally, the only thing I think about are my kids. I have two of them. Uh, the first one is Maya. She's three years old. And then I also have a seven-month-year-old. And his, his name is Dion. And to be honest with you, uh, I'm really excited about being here in this theater with you, but I was really excited about getting eight hours of uninterrupted sleep last night. <laughs> New parents are like, woo, me too, man. I'm, I'm there. Uh, that's why some people have been there here for five days, just to get sleep. This is the vacation. And you know what? When I think about the future, I think about them. Of course, I think about them. What are they going to do in the future? This is what my, my wife and I are talking about all the time. I was at a friend's house over the weekend. We had a whole bunch of friends. This is what we were talking about. How are we preparing our children for the future? What skills will be relevant for the future? This is what we were talking about. And anytime I think about them, I often think about my parents because my parents, they immigrated to this country and they risked everything to come here. And I remember once, once my parents asking me, they said, Sean, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you know, I'm from Canada, so I was like, I want to be a hockey player. <laughs> and they were like, no, here's the definite list of things that you can do. You can be a doctor, an engineer, accountant, a lawyer, or you can marry a doctor. <laughs> and they told me that these jobs are safe. These jobs are safe. And you know what? They had the best of intentions. But today, technology is on an exponential scale. Now we have things like artificial intelligence and machine learning that are impacting the future viability of some of these jobs. Potentially, these jobs won't be ready for a disruptive future. You know, um, I was, it was funny. I was at the dinner table uh, during Thanksgiving with my family the other day. It was my brother and my mother. And my, my father passed away about 10 years ago. And we were, uh, we were talking about our dreams growing up. And, you know, who's, what, what, what was everybody's dream? At first I asked my brother, I said, what was your dream growing up? And he said, my dream was to be a doctor. And he actually became a doctor. Good for him. Uh, <laughs> then I asked my mother, I said, you know, she immigrate, immigrated here from India. I said, what was your dream growing up? She said, my dream was that my children would become doctors. And I said, does that mean that I'm a disappointment? She said, yes, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> and she continued on, actually. She said she, she now has a new dream. She says, my new dream, Sean, is that your children become doctors. <laughs> this is an epidemic, by the way, in the East Indian community. If anybody can figure this out, that'd be great. But you know, sometimes I get worried about this idea of jobs of the future. And of course, my parents weren't worried about this because they just told us to get a really safe job. But this is what my wife and I are talking about. But you know, sometimes I have to remind myself that the jobs and the industry, industries of the future have not been created yet. The reason why I know this is because if I look at the last 15 years, um, these jobs didn't exist 15 years ago. I'm talking about an agricultural drone pilot, a data scientist, a mobile app developer, a, a Salesforce just hired a chief ethical and humane use officer, a chief diversity and inclusion officer. These jobs didn't exist 15 years ago but they exist today. There's actually another job that I didn't list there that is gonna change media and entertainment and culture and anybody in this room can have this job. It's brand new. A lot of kids, this is what their ambition is now. It's called a TikTok star. Do you guys know what this is? <laughs> Some people know about this. Some people don't know what this is. Let me tell you what a TikTok, I, I wonder what TikTok is in sign language. But, uh, uh, this is what a TikTok star is, by the way. This is what kids 
good doing today. It's crazy. You know, it's funny. Uh, one of the brands that we're going to be launching in, in our portfolio is um, we're, we're doing all the marketing off TikTok. And we met all these like really amazing kids at, that just got on TikTok. And their life ambition, even though they just jumped on it for three, four months, is to be a TikTok star. Like that is their ambition. This is one guy, Zach Carlson. We, we, we got him on video. That's his ambition to be a TikTok star. It's, it's star. It's crazy. And this goes back to this idea of the jobs and the industries of the future have not been created yet. And the thing is, is that everybody in this room, your job will also fundamentally change over the next 15 years. It will. It will change. It will evolve. And the people that you hire, it will also evolve as well. I believe that we're going to see more uh, data scientists, more uh, advisors, more blockchain developers, more bot managers, risk and cyber managers, videographers, creatives, and designers. Why so much creative stuff? Well, I, I feel that when a lot of technology makes a lot of the work that we be, have right now redundant, that means uh, us actually working on insights and visualization and, and being able to drive decision making uh, through creativity. But I want to go back to this question because I started this question saying that the narrative right now is that we are not preparing our workforce for the future, the skills for the future. And a lot of people ask me, what are the skills needed for the future? What are the skills needed for the future? Let me show you what the skills are needed for the future. These things, imagination and creativity, empathy, intuition, communication, emotional intelligence. These are the skills that's needed in the future. As our work becomes more transactional and linear and standardized, we can have technology do some of that work so that we can actually double down on the things that matter. This is why I say that we already have the basic skill sets to navigate in this future. And let me tell you the tragedy around this. This is the tragedy, is that when new people come to our organization, they have all these things. They're passionate, they're driven, they're, they, they, you know, they wanna do well in the world. They come to our organizations with these skills. And in the first week of work, we suck out all these things from them. <laughs> this is what happens in onboarding in the first week. This is what happens. In the first week, a nice guy named Connor comes to our organization. And we say, Connor, this is your first week in public sector finance. And we give him all the processes and procedures and the manual textbook and we put it in his DNA. And when he goes back home to his partner, to his mother, to his dog, whoever, and says, hey, how's your first week of work? He said, oh, man, it's really crazy. It's, I don't know. It seems like it's good. You know, there's, I'm just overwhelming with all the process and procedures. And the funny thing is, is when Connor asks, why do we do things like the way that we do? We say, that's how it's always been done, Connor. <laughs> You're a rookie, buddy. Okay, learn the game. And this is a tragedy because we hire all these amazing individuals who have ambition and drive and we suck it out of them in the first week. <laughs> in an exponential world, as a leader, and you're all leaders here today, as an exponential leader, in the first week when somebody joins your organization, step back, sit down, and ask Connor, how did you find our week? What did you learn? What improvements, experiments can you make over the next three weeks to make, those, to make our organization better? And you know what's going to happen? Connor is going to go back to his house, to his partner, his mom, his dog, whoever, and say, hey, I'm working for this organization, and they already asked me to make an improvement, to run an experiment over the next three weeks, and they've empowered me to make a change. And you know the magic is? The second week, Connor's going to come back and he's going to have more ideas. And the third week and the fourth week. And see, now we are actually starting to create a culture of innovation. Literally in the first week. When somebody joins our organization, it is not their onboarding. It is actually your onboarding to Connor. And this is how we can start to build a culture of innovation and, and really prepare our, 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 our skill, our, our talent for the future. Here's another narrative that I hear all the time uh, in the public sector, is this idea that technology will take away our tasks. 
Technology will take away our task, so we shouldn't adopt it. Well, I say, yes, it will take away our task, and hopefully more. You know, the hype right now, artificial intelligence and machine learning, is this one question, which is around, will robots take my job? Will robots take my job? I know a little bit about this because I live in Edmonton. We are third best in the world when it comes to AI research. I have a number of machine learning guys on my team. We're learning, working in algorithms and data models all day long. And they will tell you there's a lot of hype around this. At the MindBridge presentation, they sort of alluded to this as well. There's a lot of hype around this. Question around, will robots take my job? And in fact, if you want to know if a robot will take your job, there's a really great site called willrobotstakemyjob.com. I recommend everybody to go on it. I actually did a bit of research to see how some people in this room, in government, public sector, finance, would do in this world of automation. So at first I put in uh, uh, political science to see how those guys would do, because we love those guys. Uh, 4%, they said they were safe. Then I put in financial analysts to see how they would do. They were no worries. Congratulations to somebody, <laughs> some of you. Then I put in uh, economists, because we love them as well. 43% start worrying. <laughs> and then of course, of course, I put in accounting to see how they would do, and it turned out that they were 94% and uh, completely doomed. Uh, uh, any accountants here today? I'm just, uh, no. I'm sorry. We can all become TikTok stars. It's a really... No, but it, you know, when it, comes to, when it comes to artificial intelligence, I'm really bullish on it. I really believe that uh, we need to separate this idea of tasks and jobs. If our job is to enter something into an Excel document, then yes, your job is going to be eliminated. But most jobs have more complexity. It requires intuition and imagination and communication and emotional intelligence. And so this is, this is why AI, machine learning, RPA is going to be a beautiful thing for what we do because it's going to remove the things that we don't want to do at work the tasks that we don't want to do and shouldn't be doing as human beings, and that we can double down on what matters, like our employees, our other departments, our citizens. I think it's going to be the best thing since Luca Pacioli invented the double entry accounting system in 1494. <laughs> this is going to be the next revolution. And I know lots of organizations haven't started the journey around AI, although we talk about it lots in, in these conferences. To me, the gateway drug to artificial intelligence is around RPA, robotic process automation. And I know after my session, there is a session around RPA. And I don't want to slander RPA. But to be honest with you, RPA is dumb bots automating existing processes or just uh, an Excel macro on steroids. They will help hate me saying that, but that's what it is. But it is also the gateway drug to getting into AI. Uh, because you're going to start to see how to automate existing processes, uh, to, to run a governance framework around it, and there's already tools and technologies that you can plug into that can make it happen. Um, I think this is the starting point, and I'll talk a little bit about how I've helped other organizations um, on this path. Um, now, I believe that it's not just going to be artificial intelligence that will take away some of these tasks. Um, I think the magic of AI is when it, it combines with other technologies like what I think is one of the most disruptive technologies, which is voice. You know, a lot of people, when they talk about exponential technologies, they talk about virtual reality and augmented reality and blockchain. I love, I, I know Anne, I loved her presentation. I think voice is going to be the most disruptive. And let me tell you why. It's because of the people that are adopting it. And to put this all into perspective, I love these, these, this tweet from Pepto Abysmal. He says, um, I keep saying Alexa when I mean to say Siri, and I just can't believe I live at a time where I'm getting my servant robot's names mixed up. <laughs> I like it. And the reason why I know voice is going to be a big thing is because, you know, I look at my daughter. She's three years old. She can barely put phrases together, but she's already telling Google and Alexa to get stuff done for her. On the flip side, I look at my mother. She, you know, she's 70 years old. She missed the internet revolution. She missed the mobile revolution. But she's using voice 100 times a day. Now I walk in my house and I see my daughter uh, doing this. Hello. 
By the way, this is a hundred times a day that this happens. <laughs> Just over and over. Hello, hello, hello. And listen, I know there's some people in this room that think voice is not going to be a big thing. And in fact, that you don't want it in. How many people in this room actually have an Alexa or a Google in your house? Okay, I would say about 60% of people. The other 40%, the reason why you don't want this in your house or in your office is because you think it's creepy. <laughs> you think it's listening to you. And listen, this is a good thing. You should think that it's creepy. Because with every single innovation, it starts out as creepy and then it changes our behavior. It always does this. You know, when the internet came out, people said, I don't want to, I don't want to put my credit card online. And then everybody did. <laughs> you know, when online dating started, people were like, I don't want to put my profile up there. What if there's psychopaths? And now we go through millions of psychopaths every single second. <laughs> How many people in this room have bought or sold something on Kijiji or Craigslist? Raise your hand. Wow, everybody. <laughs> Group of uh, finance people, right? Uh, <laughs> and you know, when you make that transaction, in the back of your mind, you're thinking to yourself, I hope that that person is not a serial killer. <laughs> but you still make that transaction because it's fast and it's seamless and efficient. And this is the whole thing with innovation. It always starts out as creepy and then it changes our behavior then we just don't even think about it. The same thing will happen with voice. Everyone will have it in their office. Um, everybody will adopt it. Um, this, is gonna be the, this is gonna be one of the most beautiful things when it comes to voice is that it's gonna remove the back end stuff that we, that we don't wanna do and have a really a beautiful front end. Let me give you an example of this. Um, I might just say, um, Alexa, uh, Alexa, what's my funding look like for next year? And it'll just show up. You know, when I walk into organizations, most of the time people are just on their computers copying, pasting, putting things into systems. And the magic of voice is that you can retrieve information and put information seamlessly. So this is the next era. This is why I think it's going to be so disruptive. Now, the other narrative that we tell ourselves, in government especially, is this, everybody's going to expect this, is this idea that we are being asked to do more with less. We are asked to be doing more with less. More with, do more with less. I hear this all the time. And today I will finally tell you that now we can do way more with way less. Now you might not like this statement, but let me tell you, you know, over the last couple decades, the people that have won have been in this digital space. I'm talking about the engineers who could code, the guys and girls in their basement. These are the people that have won. But today, ladies and gentlemen, not only are ecosystems becoming the new digital, and this is what the next decade is gonna look like, but we are entering into this amazing revolution. It's called the no code revolution, and this is why it's gonna be one of the greatest times to be in public sector finance, because we don't need to know how to code. In fact, we don't need to hire people that need to code. Technology is becoming commoditized. It's it's all, people are already creating the base infrastructure for us to innovate on top of it. Um, from a private sector perspective, you, know, you can see people jumping, plugging into websites and e-commerce and project management, whatever you want, any, any, any foundation, technology infrastructure that you want, it's already out there. And it's for us to build on top of it. Um, it's really becoming a commodity. The other thing that is becoming ubiquitous is this idea of talent. You know, traditionally, if you want to get work done, you would walk in your office and say, who is available to do this work and when can I get this work done? Well, today, ladies and gentlemen, talent is ubiquitous. You can get really great talent anywhere. There's sites like Upwork where you can get anybody to do anything at a radically cheaper cost using gig workers. There's sites like Fiverr, an entire marketplace where, that is engineered for getting things done for $5. That's micro workers. You can leverage the crowd around you. You put up a design on 99 designs, 100 people compete for the work, and one person gets paid. This is a state of design. And so traditionally, we always thought, well, in order to get stuff done, we need to leverage the people on our payroll, which are called the employees. But now, because 
of the widening of the human talent spectrum, we have all this talent at our fingertips. You know, it's changed my behavior. Anytime I have a particular task, I say, do I need to do this work? Or can somebody else do this work at a radically cheaper cost and better? It's changed the behavior of my consultants. Back in the day, we used to hire really smart people out of school. And then they would, get, they would do data entry and copying, pasting between decks, de uh, uh, decks. And now they're becoming more like freelance managers. They're curating content and analysis, analysis from all over the world and bringing these things together. They're actually developing management and leadership skills off the get-go. It's wild. Because now we have everybody really at our fingertips. You know, I mentioned that I started my career in Singapore and I, I'm going to bring that uh, Singapore up a couple times because I think they're doing some really cool things when it comes to the public sector space. And I love how they've really used the crowd to achieve their outcomes. You know, recently this summer, they uh, put, up, put out an RFP for, uh, uh, they, they wanted a, a better way to achieve their health outcomes for Singaporeans. And they said, how could we partner with a wearable device uh, and actually gamify our entire city so that people could, uh, so we can achieve our health outcomes. So Fitbit actually won that RFP, and now they have the opportunity to give a Fitbit to everybody in Singapore. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And you're gonna see Singapore really achieve their outcomes because of this, because they're partnering with the ecosystem and leveraging the crowd. I love this idea. Now, they just got bought by Google, so I don't know what's happening on the privacy uh, perspective. Uh, I don't know if Fitbit figured that out or, or Singapore did, but um, that's going to be an implication for sure. Now, let, let me take a private sector example just to give you context around this and how much the world is changing. You know, one of the metrics, one of the metrics that I really love to analyze is this one metric around market cap or valuation per employee. Basically, how much is your company worth with how many people work in your organization? Now, if I were to ask you which organization in your mind has the best market cap per employee which company would you say? Just yell it out. I'm just curious. Just yell it out. Anybody, just yell it out. Google? Microsoft? Cannabis, I heard? No, no. <laughs> Amazon? You know, this company that I love is run by a 22-year-old mother, and her market cap per employee is more than any of the companies that you listed. And she's a Kardashian. <laughs> Kylie Jenner has a company called Kylie Cosmetics with seven employees. She's built a company up to $1.2 billion. She just sold $600 million of it. Uh, and now she's, you know, she's not only built up this company, but now she's exited from the company. With seven employees, she's built a billion dollar business. How has she done this? Well, she has leveraged third parties, the ecosystems around her. She, all her warehousing and production is bun, done by a third party company called Seed Beauty. All her e-commerce e is done by Shop Shopify. All her PR and finance is done by somebody else. She's basically just doubled down on what she is good at, which is using marketing and branding and social media in novel ways. And because of this, she's been able to build an exponential organization with a very small team. Exponential output with a very small team. And I feel the same way that we can do, the same thing that we can do in public sector. You know, in the public sector, one of the things that we always want to strive towards is reaching our outcomes. And normally the discussion around reaching our outcomes is, well, in order for us to do that, we need more funding and we need more people. Well, I believe that if we can leverage the ecosystem around us and the technologies and the talent around us and the companies around us, we can actually build an exponential government. I really do believe that. Now, the other thing that is, the, well, the other narrative that I hear all the time in public sector finance is this idea that we're primarily there to record the past. Well, I believe that the future is really around insights and being insight driven. How many people are familiar with this idea of a digital twin? Raise your hand. Okay, nobody, okay, good. Uh, I was trying to explain this idea of a digital twin to my wife the other day. And she was like, Sean, if you had a digital twin yourself, um, he should be a little bit taller, a little bit slimmer, and take me out to really nice places. I was like, wow, that was really specific. She was like, yeah, I was talking about this guy. Um, uh, <laughs> he's got a show on Netflix called Patriot Act. This, guy, this guy's name is Hassan Minaj. Apparently my digital twin, it's funny, my, my, my daughter came in the room while we were watching the show on Netflix and she was pointing to the television. She was like, daddy, daddy. And I looked at her and I said, baby, that is me actually. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to disappoint her, she's three years old. Uh, 
No, but this whole idea of a digital twin is, is, is remarkable. It's taking a digital replica of a tangible thing in the physical world and taking all its data and reconstructing it in the digital sense. Let me give you an example, try to simplify it. Um, I have a, a Apple Watch, I normally wear it, and I have this thing called a Whoop. The Apple Watch tracks my fitness, the Whoop tracks my sleep. Oddly enough, I'm not getting any sleep or working out, so I'm not really sure why. But, um, uh, but if I had my own digital twin, I could be able to take the data from my physical self and see, run scenarios around how different training programs might impact Digital Sean and maybe I could adopt some of those uh, training reg regimens. I, I, you know, typically I would probably just like watch my Digital Sean while I ate chips or something like that, but, <laughs> but um, this is the promise of the Digital Twin. It, you know, people are already using this concept in manufacturing, in wind farms. In fact, Singapore uh, just created a digital city. They created a digital replica of their city um, so that they can make insights around their infrastructure, their roads, transportation, um, and so that they can be a lot more insight driven because now they have a digital replica of it. I think every government uh, will have a digital twin for all their assets. I mean, this is when we combine a lot of these technologies uh, together. This is really what's going to happen. With the digital twin, we're going to move from reporting to predictive, and we're going to be able to utilize asset infrastructure and use it more efficiently. I think this is going to be tremendous. And this is the combination of when we have all these technologies together. This is really what the future will look like. I think it's really exciting. Now, combining all these technologies together, you're probably thinking to yourself, I wonder what the future of finance will look like. I wonder what the future of finance will look like. And I am also interested in understanding what the future of finance looks like. And typically when I want to ask this question, I usually go to my finance philosopher. Um, her name is uh, Kelly Rowland. <laughs> let, me ex let me explain this. Um, Kelly Rowland was in the Destiny's Child. It was her, Beyonce, and somebody else. I can't remember her name. But, uh, <laughs> Michelle. Michelle? Was that she? I am sorry if she's here today. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but you might not remember this, but Back in the day, she put out a music video with Nelly. It was Nelly and Kelly. It was called Dilemma. And in that video, Kelly was seen texting Nelly through Microsoft Excel. <laughs> and of, of course, Kelly was pissed about it because Nelly didn't respond, respond back because it was through Excel. Uh, but she was doing this. And this turned into a huge meme you know, everybody made fun of Kelly. And actually, Kelly responded earlier this year about it. Like, 15 years later, she actually responded, and this is what she said. And you know, the one thing that I was thinking about when I was watching this was, God damn, she's had a good life! Kelly Rowland, oh my goodness, she's had a good life. She doesn't know what Excel is, but this is why I think Kelly Rowland is the future. <laughs> Kelly Rowland is the future. Because this is the promise around finance. 99.99% .99 of finance professionals use Excel. And by combining a lot of these technologies together, we can actually remove not only Excel, but some of these redundant tasks and really create a new future for ourselves. And this is why I believe finance will be the sexiest job in the world. Some people are sitting there thinking, it's already the sexiest job in the world. <laughs> I get that. I'm just saying for other people to realize that it's the sexiest job in the world. Um, I'm really excited about this. But maybe you know about some of these innovations that are happening. Maybe you know about you know, the digital twin and artificial intelligence and blockchain and all these beautiful things. I think there's a couple things holding people back when it comes to innovation, especially when it comes to finance. And um, the one thing that's holding finance back is what I call uh, romantic narratives. We get really romantic about what we do today or what we did it in the past around our business. It's called a romantic narrative. And it, it, it not only holds us around what we do today, but we also go back to, well, I have a designation, this is, you know, this is what I've gone to school for, this is what I know, 
These are narratives that prevent us from really innovating. Um, listen, I'm a CPA as well, but I use the, the foundation of a CPA uh, to build on top of it. You might have an MBA or a BBA or whatever you have, but um, you know, it's, it's, it, those designations are designed for us to build on top of it. Let me give you an example of this. You know, I'm a, I'm a big student of sociology. I think there's a, there's a nice uh, connection between innovation and sociology. So one of the sociologists that I love to read, his name is Carl Weick. In one of his studies, he studied uh, wilderness firefighters. These wilderness firefighters would go in treacherous situations. And sometimes when there would be a disaster, um, these firefighters, they would have to run. And typically what would happen is that these firefighters would run holding these heavy, heavy tools in their hand that would encumber their run, running. And what Carl White discovered is that all the firefighters that died, they all died holding these heavy, heavy tools in their hand. And in the testimonials of the survivors, the people who escaped the fires, when they were asked, why did you drop your tool? They were like, we didn't want to drop our, our tool. We were just thinking about where to bury it. This is what they were saying when they were in the face of a fire that might take their life. And the unusual observation that Carl Weick had is that the reason why the firefighters didn't want to drop their tools is because those tools were part of their upbringing, it was part of their expertise, and it was part of their identity. And it was very difficult to drop their tools when the environment changed around them. And ladies and gentlemen, this is what I see all the time within organizations. We get so romantic about the tools that we have and the expertise that we have that even in the face of a disruptive world, in the face of an exponential era, we still grip onto the tools that we are so romantic about. And I believe that um, this is the era to finally start dropping our tools. Now let me tell you another narrative that actually hurts us a lot. And I know we like to joke about it, but it does hurt us a lot. We have this narrative that finance is boring and analytical and not sexy. Well, I believe that in a new world, in the exponential world, finance is a lot more about innovation and being strategic. And I think this is the only way for us to survive in this new era. You know, it's funny, in, 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 the, in 2000, KPMG predicted that in 2010, finance would be eliminated. And look, we're still here, 1,200 people, we're still here. Um, but I, I feel to make it to the next era, we have to build what I call innovation capital. Let me try to explain this. Innovation capital is your ability for others to believe in your ideas and for you to unlock resources to make those ideas happen. This is what innovation capital means. I've been working a lot more with publicly traded uh, executives over the last a number of years, and they understand that Innovation capital is so much more important, not only within our organization, but outside of our organization as well. One of the people that has the best innovation capital, and you would probably agree, is this one guy, Elon Musk. In fact, um, in 2012, July 31, 2012, he responded to somebody and said, would love to make a Tesla super truck with crazy torque, dynamic air suspension, and corners like this, like it's on rails. That would be sweet. Not sure if you saw the news yesterday, but uh, Elon came out with this uh, truck, the cyber truck. It's pretty unbelievable. He told the world what he was doing, and then he executed against it. Um, it's pretty unbelievable. The, the, the only downside of this whole thing is that anytime anybody comes out with something really new and innovative, the internet just goes on this meme factory. I just saw so many people saying, I wonder where they got the inspiration for the cyber truck. Um, was it the wedge? Um, <laughs> or, or was it this, uh, was it this thing? I don't know what that is. Or, or, or my favorite that I found online, was it, was it Tomb Raider? Uh, uh, anyways, hey, be, besides this, I think what's interesting about what Elon and Tesla has been able to do, not only from an organizational standpoint, but from a leadership standpoint, is develop, develop this idea of innovation capital. You know, I was working with a, a company called Cummins. They're an innovative company. Actually, 90% of the companies on the Fortune 500 ha have like disappeared from the list since 1955. 
Cummins is still on them. And I was working with Cummins, and they were, uh, they actually produced the first semi-electric truck. They were the first ones to do this in 2017. And a couple months later, uh, they were valued at 25 billion. A couple months later, this company comes out of nowhere and introduces their semi-electric truck. Guess who got all the mentions and all the, all the love, whether it's on the internet and through the market? Well, it was Tesla. Now, Cummins really likes Tesla because they've pushed the narrative when it comes to electric vehicles. They've pushed the narrative, but they don't understand the difference between their market performance. Cummins is actually a very innovative company, has deep partnerships and relationships, yet their market cap is nowhere near Tesla. Well, here's the amount of times that people talk about Tesla innovation versus Cummins innovation. Cummins is in red. <laughs> um, and this is part of it. There is a direct correlation between how many times you share and execute around your innovations and how the market perceives this. This not only happens from a market perspective, but this happens all the time internally. Let me give you another example of where this happens. It's not a startup using it, but using uh, an incumbent actually using this uh, idea. Um, I believe that Marriott Hotels will beat Airbnb in the long run. Um, Marriott Hotels started as a root beer company in the 1920s and now they're one of the most innovative companies in terms of accommodation in the world. And the reason why they're going to beat Airbnb, and you can see their market price over the last five, five years and how they've done, the reason why they've been able to increase their market share is because they talk about innovations and execute against innovations um, even as much as Airbnb does. This is the how many times people talk about Marriott innovation versus Airbnb innovation. Marriott is in red. There is a direct correlation between your in innovation capital that you create and how people perceive you and your ability to create more innovations. This is the whole thing, is that by building innovation capital, you're able to work on more innovations, more strategic components. Um, and the secret to building innovation capital is to really share and execute against your in innovation initiatives. This is the secret. Not only after it's done, but before it happens, during, while you're working on this innovation, this is the secret, to, to share and execute openly. And one of the best ways of building innovation capital is through experimentation. Starting with small teams and small problems and small sprints and seeing how you can move the needle. This is how you build innovation capital. Let me, let me give you an example of this. Um, I was working in a, uh, ener the energy industry, working for a very nostalgic energy company called NAL Resources. They're a mid-tier energy company in Alberta. And listen, if you want to try anything innovative, you don't do it in energy because they will ask you, who else in my industry is doing this? This is what happens. This is the narrative all the time in, in energy. And we met with NAL Resources and we said, what we want you to do is experiment with RPA, robotic process automation, that you're going to learn a lot more in the next session. And we said, we want you to trial this. And so what we did is we, we took a process within finance, one process within finance, and with a very small sprint, over a couple different weeks with two people, we were able to showcase that we could get a 20x improvement on the humans that were working there. And because of that one experiment, they had opened up a digital center of excellence because of that experiment. And because of that one experiment, now they're getting into artificial intelligence and blockchain and all these amazing exponential technologies. And it started by one simple experiment in finance and a leader, his name is Corey Berg, building his own innovation capital, small experiments, being able to do a lot more. Um, I've seen this work. I've seen it change organizations. You know, a lot of people ask me, they say, Sean, um, how do I find experiments within my organization? I think that the best way of finding experiments is to follow people around. It's not only to follow people around at work, but follow around people on the way to work, at skating practice. I call this ethnographic research. You might call it creeping, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> I think it's a really great way of doing this. You know, um, you know, when I was in Singapore, the one thing that we didn't do that I wish we did was instead of asking people what they wanted, we should have followed people around. That would have been less creepy. Oh, I don't know if it's less creepy. But anyways, um, let me give you an example of somebody who has done, done this. And it's not a business example or a tech example because you've had a lot of that over the last five days. Um, here's an example of how Andre Agassi was able to beat Boris Becker at tennis. 
And he did it not by practicing more, not by studying analytics, not by betting, getting a better coach, but he did it by watching Becker and watching his tongue. Let me explain. When Boris Becker would serve the ball, he would stick out his tongue, and that would indicate where he would serve the ball. And Agassi was able to figure this out, and he was able to beat Boris Becker nine out of the next 11 matches. And Agassi actually told Becker about this many, many years later, and this is what Becker said. So I told Boris about this uh, after he was retired because uh, I just showed really good judgment for my own self-preservation and didn't share this with him before. I told him at uh, Oktoberfest, we went out in Oktoberfest in Germany and had a, had a pint of beer together and, and I couldn't help but say, by the way, did you, did you know you used to do this and give away your serve? He, uh, he about fell, fell off the chair and he says, I used to go home all the time and just tell my wife it's like he reads my mind. And he said to me, little did I know you were just uh, reading my tongue. <laughs> I love this example. So if there's one thing that you want to learn, you know, you want to take home for the last five days, is just follow your people around. And if you get arrested, let me know. It would be a really great part of the story. Um, now, before I leave, I, I, have, I didn't bring my business cards with me, but you can send me a note on LinkedIn and I can send you the slides. It's a big file, it's like 1.3 gigs. Um, so like, don't download it on the plane because you might take it down. Uh, but uh, you can send me a note. But I just wanna summarize what we went through today and what an exponential leader looks like in this new era. It's someone that's focused on the human skills, not just jobs. Someone that's focused on automation, leveraging the ecosystems around us, becoming a lot more insights driven and focused on this ability of uh, building innovation capital and experimentation. I think this is what makes an exponential leader in an exponential era with all these exponential technologies. And here's my epiphany. All the tools and technologies that we ever needed are now out there. All the talent that we ever wanted is now ubiquitous. All the knowledge that we ever wanted is commoditized. And by the way, the aggregate of all of human history and knowledge and creativity and, 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 and talent, they all sit in our pocket. These things are no longer differentiators. What I would tell organizations and individuals and finance leaders and my kids is that I really do believe what will differentiate people in the future is having this exponential mindset, this ability that everything is today is really at our fingertips. You know, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to be here today. Um, I'm a CPA, my wife's a CPA, my father was a CPA, and um, he passed away about 10 years ago. I had to like run his tax firm uh, with 200 clients and um, you know, run his finance group. And uh, you know, I know the, I, you know, I'm the last person on this planet that wants this profession to turn into a commodity or an algorithm within our organizations. And I hope that you can see that disruption is really an opportunity. And I hope that you can also see that today is the greatest time to be in finance ever. And it's really up to you to create the future. Thank you so much for your time today. It was a pleasure. Now, we have uh, we have a.